So, we're still at the birth of modern scientific psychology. And we've said that there were a variety of wild variety, bewildering variety of approaches taken. We couldn't hope to cover the various and creative forms of experimentation that have continued to proliferate in the 150 years since then. But one particular method that became popular briefly needs to be discussed directly, and that is introspection. Introspection is the perhaps reasonable notion that you might be the best person to tell us about your mind. Unfortunately, people just aren't very good at this. So if I ask you, why did you make a judgment? Why did you decide to do this? What motivated your behavior? What were your thought processes? The answers we get from people are very, very unreliable. We don't seem to have introspective access to something called a mind. Introspection existed along with other uh, techniques, and it wasn't just free form, um, tell me what's going on in your mind. There were attempts, um, largely driven by Wilhelm Wundt in Leipzig, to develop quite rigorous protocols that would ensure that the manner in which um, the questioning was done was very constrained, uh, to a, in the hope that this would allow the results to be objective in some sense, that they could be reproduced in other laboratories. Um, and it didn't work. Um, it turned out that if you have very rigorous protocols, you can get reasonably consistent results as long as you keep the same experimenter, but change labs and everything goes out the window. So it came in for a great deal of criticism because this is uh, an affront to the objective ambitions of any science. Before we leave it in the dust, let's note two things about it. One, it got a certain class of psychologists a bad name and led to a backlash, which we'll meet as behaviorism. And secondly, it never went away because we are all somehow witnesses to our own experience of the world. And nobody is going to buy a scientific theory that tells them that their experience of reality is somehow irrelevant or not valid. So introspection remains as a sort of a filter of last resort by which people intuitively judge whether they're willing to entertain a psychological theory or not. So the history I'm outlining here is deliberately simplified, of course. And there's a sort of a fairy story we tell undergraduates about the history of psychology. And it goes like this. At the birth of scientific psychology in the middle of the 19th century, there was a methodological cornucopia. All kinds of things were tried out, including introspection. But introspection got a bad name, and along came behaviorism, which put the science back into psychology by ruling out any appeal to ghostly mental entities or processes or anything you couldn't observe. And this had lots of problems with it as well. We'll meet all these in a little while. Um, and it was replaced in the middle of the 20th century with the cognitive revolution, something we will be coming back to again and again and again. This gave rise to the computer metaphor and discussion of uh, something called information processing, whatever that is. And that particular turn, the cognitivist turn, has itself come under threat recently with the flourishing of alternative approaches which emphasize the body um, and don't make the brain into a mystical object. Um, but that neat orderly progression there is belied by the diversity of the approaches actually undertaken. There's a brief map showing some of the main developments in scientific psychology and as you can see it's all over the place. One very important development the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, which we will not have much cause to discuss, discuss further, but which belongs in any historical overview, is the development of psychoanalysis. You've probably heard of these two characters, Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, both pioneers in their own way. Um, their legacy persists to this day. They are still very, very influential. Freud understood himself to be a pioneer in our understanding of the human <clears throat> psyche. And he was well aware that he didn't have appropriate scientific concepts with which to develop his theory of the dynamics of the mind. 
Um, Jung never really aspired to being a scientist in that sense, I think, although he maintained contact with lots of scientists. From Freud, we get a notion that has never gone away, which is the notion of the unconscious mind. This is a notion tied to Freudian psychology. It is not a something you can appeal to outside of that framework without running into problems. For Freud, the human mind was a turbulent place. Both behavior and experience arose from the dynamics of forces of which you are ordinarily not aware. No one of these forces was coextensive with the person. He saw three principal engines underlying the manifestation of mind. There was the id, which is animal in nature, follows desires. It's kind of brutish, not equipped with a moral compass. There was the superego, which is this, which is the socially informed conscious that tells you, no, you shouldn't do that. That's bold. And mediating the conflicts that inevitably arise between these twin sources of motivation lies the ego, which is which tries to maintain a public self-image and tries to be respectable and wear pants at all times. And it's basically faced with sorting out the battles between the id and the superego. Now, Freud was a dirty old Victorian gentleman obsessed with sex and its role in, role in personal development. We cannot erase that from his record. Yes, he was a pioneer in talking about sex and sexuality. He was a pioneer in introducing the frank, open scientific discussion of sex. But his view of it is not one we want to entertain. He developed a method called psychoanalysis, which was a new form of therapeutic relationship between a client and an analyst. And that has mutated since and given birth to thousands of variants. Most of these still rely critically on the personality of the therapist for their effectiveness. So you can see this is not looking like a scientific method. Um, psychoanalysis never became a, um, a territory that science had much to say about. It remains very popular in the therapeutic sphere, and so this still belongs in the broader domain of psychology. But this, the work that Freud was undertaking was so new that he knew he was making these brave, imaginative leaps and, and into the unknown. He hoped that they would someday become scientific, and they didn't. But he did provide us with a very rich set of concepts and metaphors for thinking about ourselves and our development, our attachments, our relationships. Um, so his influence remains very, very strong. Carl Jung is a, another kettle of fish. Jung worked with Freud for about seven years together. And although they were early enthusiastic collaborators, they went their separate ways and entertained a great disdain for each other later on. They parted company, not necessarily on the best of terms. He took psychotherapy in very, very different directions. He was not as obsessed with sex as Freud was, although he had interesting things to say on the subject. He instead tried to attach the structures with which we interpret the world to cultural creations, to myths, to the cultural history. He introduced the notion of a collective unconscious. This is completely different from the unconscious mind of Freud. The collective unconscious is distributed through, throughout culture. And in this hypothetical collective unconscious, there are certain figures, certain archetypes which resonate. Um, now, this view of the mind as being so culturally formed is something we will be coming back to when we meet um, the, and when we meet in contrast Piaget and Vygotsky in developmental psychology. But it's clear that Jung's understanding of the mind is not consistent with an account in which minds are in individual, hidden away in brains. His work, it must be said, is spiritual, mystical, and imaginative. I'm a big fan of Jung myself, but it has not become part of the scientific end of psychology. So we won't have anything further to say about these gentlemen, but we cannot neglect them in the history of the discipline.